Hey, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Eugene Sun. Uh, I have here Harry Yoon and uh, Lee Isaac Chung with me. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of introduction first before we dive into uh, our discussion for the film today. But uh, I am a filmmaker and I'm also one of the co-directors of Real Spirituality, which is the film initiative through the Bram Center at Fuller Seminary. Uh, this is a very special event. Uh, we are being co-sponsored by uh, Fuller's uh, Center for Asian American Theology and Ministry which is otherwise known as the Asian American Center. And if you want to find out more information about the Asian American Center, or if you want to study Asian American theology, uh, you can go on their website at fuller.edu slash AAC. And uh, the center also has a podcast called Centering the Asian American Christian Podcast. So that is a podcast that you can find at centeringpodcast.com. That's C-E-N-T-R-I-N-G podcast.com. And we also want to thank uh, A24 for allowing us to show uh, this movie. So uh, we're just very excited about it. So what's going to happen now is that I'm just going to chat with these uh, gentlemen and uh, dive right into it. So I think, first of all, I'm just going to do a very brief introduction. Uh, so Isaac here, uh, the Isaac Chun is the writer and director of Minari, which is the film that you just saw. And uh, I, I think probably in the, for the, in, in, in the interest of uh, full disclosure, uh, I will also say that Isaac is actually a very dear friend of mine and uh, someone who's a brother figure to me and uh, who frankly actually has been very important in my life, both in terms of uh, in, in a professional capacity as well as in a personal capacity. I hope I'm not embarrassing you <laughs> by saying this, Isaac. But uh, so it's a great pleasure, frankly. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be. No, now. Yeah, I, I helped you meet your wife. So I, <laughs> <laughs> that is 100% true. Um, among other things, I would not be married right now. I would still be a, a miserable bachelor somewhere. <laughs> yes. If I could drop a microphone now and walk off. <laughs> Yeah, people don't, people are like, wow, that's, that's enough. I just, that's, the, 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 that, that's all I need to know for this Q&A, <laughs> just that part. So, but frankly, I mean, it's just a great, great pleasure for me to be, to be now in the position of, uh, of interviewer asking you uh, about this very special yeah, movie, you, which Jim. I know is very dear to you. So we're, we're getting to that momentarily. And Harry Yoon uh, is the distinguished editor of Minali. And uh, Harry obviously has been around for a while and has worked on many uh, distinguished projects, including Detroit, directed by Catherine Bigelow. I think, Harry, I know you edited uh, Euphoria, Newsroom, Best of Enemies, and you also worked on The Revenant and uh, First Man, among other recent films. So uh, we're just very happy and glad that you're here with us. So thank you, Harry. Yeah, unfortunately, I have not had as much of an impact on your life, Eugene, but I'm, I'm very happy <laughs> to be here as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's all going to be focused on Isaac, basically. And the one thing I want, I would say, Harry, who has I'll had... Totally, I'll totally understand if that's the case. <laughs> Harry, who's had no impact on my life <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> what, what do you have to say about this? <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I think we can really just like chat like this uh, very casually about about uh, the about this movie, but also your experience making it, because obviously you know since the premiere of Sundance last year, where the film won the uh, Grand Jury Prize and the Audience Prize, which are the two top awards uh, at the festival, you know over the past twelve months or so, uh, it's been generating so much buzz, and the movie will be released uh, in, in February. So I think this will just be a good time to really go back and uh, reflect on the journey of making this movie. So, and feel free to jump in, you know, anytime, uh, either one of you, but I think I would just start out by asking Isaac, I think just very, uh, on a very fundamental and basic level, you know, what drove you to do this movie, to write this movie and um, decide to just dive all in? Um, yeah, I guess it, around 2018, um, I was, I, it was the beginning of the year and I kind of felt like maybe I don't have too many more chances to make films. That's kind of the way that I felt life was going. Uh, and I, I started to think about, you know, fundamentally, what is it that I want to do? What, what kind of story do I want to tell? And uh, all, all these other things were happening as well that were kind of pointing me to the direction of, of focusing on uh, stuff that happened in my own life when I was a child. Um, one of the key things I like to talk about with that is that uh, my daughter turned the age that I was when we first moved to the, the farm in Arkansas. And I became the age that my dad was at that time. And so there was something about that interplay that got me really thinking about that time in my life. 
Um, and as an exercise, I started to just write down all these memories of, of that time. Um, and I had about like 80 visual memories, essentially. And as I was looking at that and starting to order them in my mind, I, I, I saw the beginnings of a story. Um, and I think it was that uh, when I thought about the Minari that my grandmother came and planted at this creek, um, that stood out the most to me, that, that I just could imagine a film that ends at a Minari patch and that the actual name of the film would be Minari. And with that in mind, I just wanted to try to write something that would ultimately deliver in leading up to that ending. So that, that was really the genesis of this. Yeah, and if I may also speak on a more personal note, because I know that journey in terms of how you arrive at this point uh, and then how you arrive at the point of writing Inali, because you started making movies back in the late 2000s and the first film came out, uh, Muir and Gobble came out in 2007. And so prior to this, you know, you had made three feature films and, you know, of different tones, different mm -hmm. stories, different geographical locations. And I, I know that as far back as I remember 10 years ago, I remember you saying that, you know, you want to do a story about your family somehow. And there were other yeah. uh, attempts to, to do this. So I, I'm just curious. Uh, and I, and I kind of know the story a little bit about, I know a little bit about the story, but I was wondering if you can sh share with the viewer, I mean, why, uh, you had, is it, is it just becoming a father? Is it, you know, kind of what's happening, what was happening in your career at the time? What drove you to finally say, I, this is the story I'm gonna tell, but also this is the particular manner, the particular way in which I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell it. Yeah, it, it's strange. I think it was around 2013 when my daughter uh, was born um, that my, my mother-in-law, first of all, um, she came and helped us out when my daughter was born. And she, she lived with us for like a month. And, and as I was taking her back to the airport, um, she encouraged me and said, um, now that you have a daughter, you probably, like one thing she said that kind of made its way into the film is that your daughter needs to see you working. Your daughter needs to see you, you um, doing well at your work, if that makes sense. Um, and, and she didn't mean like success. She meant like making something that is of worth. Um, and so she's, she's also very religious. She's very, she's very much a devoted uh, believer. And she kind of spoke in those terms of, of the way that I need to honor God with what I'm doing. Um, and that got me thinking quite a lot. And I started to think, starting then, I think I, I talked to you about it at that point, that I'd love to be able to, to make something that I can leave behind for her um, that, that talks about family. And, and in fact, you, you did play, we, we were joking about, you know, the impact that I had in your life, but even in 2017, I remember in the fall, um, I started to tell you, okay, the last script that I wrote, I, I don't like it. I'm not going to do it. Now I'm going to, maybe I'll do another family story script, but I'm going to situate it in Rwanda again. And I remember you encouraged me, no, why don't you think about doing something in Arkansas with your own family. And so that, I remember that kernel was there too. You, you really did encourage me at that point. That was like in October of 2017. That's right, that's right, I do remember that, yeah. Yeah, and at the time I was kind of annoyed with you. I thought, <laughs> I, I just told you what I'm gonna do and you're, you're you know, but, but that stuck with me. And, and you know, it was, it was, it was that. And, and um, I, I also noticed that when I'd talk about Arkansas and, uh, being in a family of chicken sexers and things like this, it, it would always raise a lot of questions where people wanted to find out more and, and hear more about it. So I thought, who knows, maybe it is interesting. When, when you live the life, you don't think that your own life is that interesting, but um, other people seem to be interested in, in that story, so. Yeah, it's yeah. funny because I, I do remember that was my own reaction too. just I think just as a friend and colleague that at the time when you were telling me that you were going to set this in Rwanda and, and possibly do a version of the story overseas. I, I do remember thinking at the time, it's like the story of an Asian American family in Arkansas. That, that <laughs> itself is amazing. Why wouldn't you do it uh, just as that? But, but obviously, as you're saying, yeah. I think all of us, we all have interesting stories and, uh, and experiences, but sometimes we, we ourselves, we, we don't have that perspective and, and aren't able to see that in fact we have something worth telling and sharing with the world. Because um, yeah, I also yeah. know you to be a very self-effacing person and, and someone who doesn't really draw attention much uh, to himself. So was there any, in terms of really making this movie, obviously it is 
semi-autobiographical. It's not completely autobiographical. It's not, yeah, you know, yeah. it's been dramatized, but the idea of doing something that really is very personal to you, that you are exposing something uh, that I think could possibly be very private in your own life. Was there any kind of difficulties and hesitations um, there in that process? Um, yeah, for sure. I, I, I think the, the first part of that is, is true that I, I wasn't sure if it's interesting um, because it's, it's uh, stuff that happened in my own life. Um, in fact, we were driving, um, we went to Caro's diner together in South Pasadena. <laughs> and then I remember right. I kind of gave you the rundown of this story idea and, and how it would go from point A to point uh, B and, and how it would end with this, this fire and stuff. And, and I remember I turned to you and I just said, is, is this interesting at all? <laughs> <laughs> I remember asking you that question, uh, but and but I, remember, really I, I, remember I, eating, I remember I was eating. I remember I was eating. I just go, why? What again? Like, I <laughs> yeah. was, wasn't paying attention at all. I'm just kidding. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Green. So yeah, that that stuff was tough. And then and then you also know when you're doing something so personal with your family members involved. Um, I mean, speaking on behalf of your family in a very public space is, uh, it's it's really it, it's a scary thing and. and I'm still scared to, to talk about it. And um, uh, yeah, just, just with my relationship with my parents and wanting to honor them and uh, wanting to do their story justice. And um, at the same time, uh, feeling like I'm not giving them as much agency in the telling of the story, like all that stuff was very scary for me. Yeah, because I remember even, uh, I mean, while you were thinking about this idea and prior to that, I remember the one thing you were always worried about was that you know your parents would get to see this movie and that itself played a, a, a big part, I think, in terms of that being something that was present on your mind. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I do want to get, get into that a, a little bit, but I, I think ultimately, I think what is special about the movie, and we'll talk about the story in a second, but it, it is that, um, because there, there was a version of the story that you that I remember you writing before that, that we worked on a little bit, where it was primarily told from the perspective a little bit from the, 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 the child. And here, I think you can one can argue that I think David is still the protagonist, that the movie is in many ways experienced through, through him. But uh, really, is it, it is an ensemble piece. It is about the parents. It is about the grandma. It is a movie about this whole family. So in terms of that perspective shift, I, I, I was wondering, if you can speak about that in terms of how your own maybe life experience played a part in that, in terms of you know the, the manner, the perspective through which uh, you told your story. Um, yeah, it, as I was writing it, I felt like I was relating so much, maybe more to to Jacob than to anybody else in the story. Um, just just being the same age and um, also chasing after this uh, thing of filmmaking, which is. Uh, in some ways, a crazy dream, the way that um, Jacob is chasing after farming in, in the South. Um, and so I, I found that part um, pretty interesting that I, I found myself more in that character than I did in this child character. And um, at the same time, the, the character of the child as I was writing felt like he's always watching, he's an observer. In a way, he carries this idea of retrospection uh, for the story and sets up the tone of the story as being one in which we're looking back. Um, and at the same time, he's just a, a silly kid. And uh, I, I wrote in lots of little things, the way that he talks and um, the ways in which he's a little bit disobedient. I, I admit, I, I pulled some of those things of the way I noticed Livia talking. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, another friend of ours, uh, Steve, who watched said, I think that kid really reminded me more of Livia than, than of you. And I was like, yeah, th there is some of that in there uh, by design. Um, so I don't know, it, it, being a work of fiction, even though it is a memory piece, um, there, there's a certain joy in writing and putting yourself in every character in a way. Uh, and, and I think the expression of faith, for instance, is something that, um, I, I tried to spread throughout all of the characters, um, all the way from crazy charismatic Paul, uh, which, you know, that, that type of expression is something I'm quite familiar with, uh, all the way to um, Jacob being quite a cynic and, and a skeptic, uh, which is something that I also wrestle with and deal with. Um, you know, I, I, I found that that aspect of the writing was very rewarding in a way to bring that expression to each character. Mm. 
because I, I I do feel like the uh, you know the, the spirituality of the movie you know whatever spiritual substance I, I think one might speak of I, I feel like it's just something that comes through very organic in the movie I think both in terms of the, the way the characters themselves I think body faith uh, but I think also in terms of the the warmth of the movie the compassion of the movie I think the the, the empathy it has I think with respect to all the characters which is which is a pretty remarkable thing. Um, for you, I I'm going to jump with jumping to. Uh, I'm going to ask quite uh, Harry a few questions uh, in a second, but a couple more things I want to ask. Uh, one is, I mean, in terms of that balance, the, the 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 embodiment of empathy, you know, the warmth, the humanity that, that came through. I was wondering if you can talk about that creative process, both I think the writing, but also maybe while making the movie. In in what sense was this maybe uh, an, an exercise of spirituality or faith for you? Uh, that whole process of uh, the, the creative process, as it were. Um, I mean, I, I guess it weighed in quite heavily. Um, I mean, I, I'm so glad you you talk about it in that way. Um, it, it weighed in it heavily in the way that I I feel like a lot of our spiritual spirituality is worked out in other people, in our relationships with other people, and the way that we choose to look at other people. Um, and that was a big part of it for me to try not to um, have my agenda on these characters, but to, to write characters as human beings who have somehow their own agency, their own freedom um, without any judgment, without me judging them. Um, so um, that was kind of a rule in the writing. Um, even down to the, the church where we see uh, this First Baptist Church uh, of Lincoln, where you, know, you, you hear a lot of very simplified uh, commentary on um, Southern Christians, uh, which is where I grew up, the, the sort of church I went to. Uh, but I wanted to even show them in a light that shows them in their humanity rather than in their category or in their political beliefs or anything like that. Um, so um, maybe that's the way that I felt like I, I, I was bringing all that stuff into the writing, um, just the way that I choose to look at people, I guess. Yeah, because I, I feel like, you know, in, in the hands of a different filmmaker or, or a movie like this, I think about a minority family, an immigrant family in the South surrounded by rural white people, I, I feel like it's very easy to make a movie. I think that's very binary in terms of how it looks at the world. And, you know, you can easily have portrayed, uh, I think the people on the margin, you know, the, the white people, people like Paul and other figures, you can very easily portray them as, you know, racist. And it's really about a family that's, you know, basically under siege, you know, they're in a new country, they're discriminated against. And, and I think there are many movies that have been made about that. And I think what's striking about this movie, and these are some of the questions that people at Fuller have posed to me. I, I think it is interesting how really the, the all characters, uh, including the, the Southern white characters that I think, you know, again, you could easily have portrayed them in a different manner, but they all came through as full fledged human beings. And, and that's the part that I, I know that to be you as a person. That's, that's, that's how you, great. that's how you look at the world. That's how you see people. But I think for a lot of viewers, I, I think that is just so Kind of refreshing and touching uh, when they when they see that. That's nice. No, I'm I'm weak. I, I look at people pretty basically <laughs> and terribly most of the time. Those are my interior thoughts, but that's not what I like. That's not what I wish I I, I was like. But that, but there's something interesting. Harry and I, while we were doing the edit and we we showed the test screenings, we had to calibrate Paul's performance quite a lot, and not because Will did a bad job. I mean, Will gave us so many wonderful things, but there were so many preconceived notions for audience members coming in Absolutely. Uh, for what someone like Paul represents that we had to strip away really any possible like ambiguous moment to show that, no, this is a, a decent human being. Um, As, Isaac, I think you, you were telling me that somebody told you that the whole time they were waiting for Paul to betray Jacob somehow, like even in yeah. that small scene where he's, showing him like, no, like plant it more spaced out like this. This is how we do it in Arkansas. And like, and like people were reading into that and saying like, oh, he's trying to like sabotage the farm somehow. And like, <laughs> there was this, so yeah, there, there is almost these kind of archetypes that like people were expecting because it's a minority family in, you know, a white Southern town that they were always waiting for the other shoe to drop. And 
you know, in having those conversations with um, Isaac, I, I saw how important it was for him to show the complexity and the humanity of everybody involved. And, and I think that led to some of the, some of the most difficult decisions editorially that we went with, because, you know, unfortunately mm -hmm. for time and for um, dramatic focus, we had to strip away some of the richness of, of some of these secondary characters um, in order to really hold a spotlight on the family but at least it's good to hear that like there was enough left where people aren't making those kind of um, falling into sort of uh, the, those archetypes that they might've been expecting or were afraid might emerge. Yeah, it's funny. Cause I, I, you know, we, we all have like, I have friends who, uh, you know, our mutual friends, people who were at the, uh, the advanced screenings, people who watched it when it was still a work in progress. And I do remember people telling me that when they were watching it, initially, they thought that uh, Paul really was going to be a creep somehow in one way or the other, he's going to end up hurting someone in the family. That, that really was, I think, the automatic assumption. So the fact that yeah. He came through it. He, he's just, he's a good guy. That's, that's what he is. And I think that, that is touching. So no, Harry, you mentioned that. So I'm, I'm curious, I think maybe specifically about Paul, but also in, in general, because for people who don't know, I mean, the job of an editor, among other things, you know, it's, it's not just about piecing a film together. It is about making these very difficult and hard decisions to tell not just a story, but to convey the emotion, to make sure you present the characters in ways that you want, you want the audience to, to receive them. So can you just talk about that whole process in terms of the decisions that went into uh, both, I think, Paul's character, but also just the film in general when, uh, when you were working with Isaac? Yeah, I think um, the initial, the first assembly of the film was a little over two hours and 40 minutes. And there was so much richness and um, beauty in the film. So much of what Isaac, uh, what the good news was that even from the first screening, I think it's the first screening for a director is always one of the most depressing things that, that he or she has to go through because um, uh, all they see is what they didn't get or all they see is how the film is different than this kind of platonically <laughs> platonic <laughs> ideal of the film that they yep. have imagined in their mind. And so part of what you have to be is a, is a therapist to sort of like talk them off the ledge and be like, it's okay, right there. Was there, but, was there any of that? <laughs> so I, you know, I definitely sort of saw a little bit of that in Isaac, but I think both of us, um, when we watched it, still had this sense of how special, uh, how there was something really special here. And, and so much of what our work was, was developing that kind of trust with each other where we could make bold choices mm -hmm. to start removing things and refine things, um, see redundancies that, that were there because the performance was so strong, um, to see where uh, particular moments were detours to where you know, it took us off the path of where you know, emotionally we were headed. So, um, so we started removing scenes, removing sequences, and, and, you know, and then you know, ultimately getting down to the, the much more difficult choices where uh, it wasn't redundant anymore. It wasn't, um, you know, a detour as much anymore, but there were really great things that I think were um, slowing us down a little bit, you know, even though they were working beautifully and then ultimately removing those things as well. Um, Cause I think, um, I, I think uh, one of the principles that ultimately you have to end up towards the later end of that, that process is that um, anything that if, even if it's working and it's good, doesn't sort of keep the audience on the edge of their seat, sort of like leaning in and sort of um, uh, surprised or um, taken to a new place um, as they're watching um, is something that slows the film down. And you want to get to that sort of elegant, most elegant, most muscular version of the film. And so um, both in terms of difficult decisions, but also what's great is that inevitably to try to get to that place, especially with a writer director, because this is, you're taking away pieces of themselves. You know I mean? Like this is something in which they've sort of poured their heart and their soul. You have to get to a level of trust. And what was really wonderful um, with Isaac was that A, we began with this incredible common ground of, of being Korean American immigrants and having similar stories and having that kind of like rapport to begin with. But I think what really made it special for me personally was knowing that Isaac was a believer and how much he, he sort of poured himself uh, in his identity in Christ into 
into the work and and um, being able to share that aspect of who I was uh, and to be able to relate to each other as brothers and to and to learn to really trust each other and our intentions um, I think really facilitated some of the risk taking that happened especially towards the end of that process mm-hmm. at least that's the idealized way I like to look at it. I mean, I, <laughs> Isaac, you might, you might think something. <laughs> common ground? What common ground? He's like, what? <laughs> no, but, but I'm curious. I mean, was that report, uh, I wasn't there when, 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 when that happened, but that, that sense of camaraderie and report, was that something that you felt you were able to establish right away? Or, or Harry, did it actually also take time you know, for, for that trust to really build? I, I think, you know, it, I mean, it's so incredible where we got to, but I think in any professional relationship, even if you know somebody's a believer, there's almost a kind of coming out process. Like if you know they're not a believer, there's also a coming out process that you have to do as well, right? Like, you know, like they'll ask you, oh, what did you do this weekend? And you have to make that decision to be like, oh, I went to church <laughs> or I went, to, you know, or I, you know, yeah. led my small group. And and so there's, there's a little bit of that, but I think I already had that sense that, that this was an important aspect of who Isaac was, but I didn't know how explicit it could be because everybody's faith practices and especially how it relates to their work is different. But I think little by little in the conversations that we had, I think we got to a level of comfort where we got to this place where, you know, I've never been able to do this before, but like Isaac and I would like, I would ask Isaac like, hey, before an important screening, hey, would you mind if we prayed together? about the screening, you know, would you mind if we prayed a prayer of gratitude after a screening? And it was so incredible just to be able to, to share that aspect of exercising your faith, acknowledging that, you know, the genius of anything that happened didn't come exclusively from you. It came, you know, from God and, and, and to be able to sort of show gratitude in that way was a pretty amazing experience for me just because for many years, you know, after meeting my wife, um, uh, Jane, she's uh, she has a very sort of mature and very richly developed sense of how faith integrates with her work. Uh, she runs her own law firm and has done done so for many decades. But for me, it's been uh, an uh, trying with through fits and starts to figure out how does my faith integrate with my work on a daily basis, especially with creative people, especially in Hollywood. And this is like one of these like dream come true opportunities where. I could be so much more explicit and so much more um, involved and so much more um, out about um, how I felt that uh, my faith is so integral to, to the work that I do. And, and Isaac and I would have these conversations that were like dream come true conversations, you know, in terms of discussing that type of thing. Yeah, because I, I remember even when, um, when Isaac was, uh, and the producers were assembling the, the cast and crew for this film, I, I think at the time Isaac was, telling me in real time what was happening <clears throat> and I remember just just hearing about you and, and other people it, it just really felt like there was something and I hate to spirit to over spiritualize anything but it really felt like there was something very special about this group of people and the way I think the team and the cast and, and how everything came together uh within a very short period of time but also just how yeah, perfect very short yeah, actually, if, if I you want to talk about that because I, I do think that process is kind of interesting in terms of how unlikely uh, that process was because again, I'm someone who I, I've worked with you. I, I know you, and, and I know there was a, a period of time when it really felt like nothing was happening, and, uh, and and you were still soldiering on. You were writing. You were trying to develop projects and get things off the ground. But there was a, a season where I, I think perhaps you know you you were even wondering, it's like, should I keep doing this or should I do something else? And then this happened. So I was yeah. wondering if you can reflect on that process a little bit. Yeah, I, um, I, I was living in Korea at, at the time when uh, this film kind of um, got the green light, I, I guess. Um, I was teaching and I took on this teaching job in Korea at a, at a university uh, as my way of, um, you know, maybe checking out a filmmaking, uh, just knowing that I needed to do something responsible. Um, being able to be a professor was for my parents at least some kind of victory after <laughs> complaining to me for so many years. <laughs> uh, yeah, as a, as a 40 year old man, I'm still thinking about that stuff. Um, and 
yeah, so I, I was doing that stuff. And um, at, at the same time, I had this script and I thought maybe this is the last script that I'll, I will have had time to actually write. And um, my agent at the time, Christina, uh, she, uh, she, at the time she was a friend and then she came on board as an agent and started representing it in 2017, 18. Okay. 18, that's yeah, right. The end of 2018. That's right. And then the beginning of 2019, uh, she basically showed it to Stephen and to Christina O oh at Plan B, and they came on board. Um, and then we had to try to get a green light from A24 because A24 was interested. And I think it was maybe in April that uh, Christina from Plan B told me, look, if we can't get a24 on board by this date in April, then we just can't do the film. And the only date that we can do the film due to everybody's availability is the summer of this year. So we only have a few months out to be able to get the financing for this film. And if not, you know, there, there's no Minari. Um, and, you know, I, I, was, I was teaching and trying to do all the things that were necessary to try to attract A24 to this. And um, that date, finally passed. So that date passed, the deadline that we were working on internally. And I remember I went to church on Sunday with that. And, you know, I was feeling pretty heavy hearted on Saturday before, but on Sunday I was with Valerie and Livia and we're, we're uh, attending this, this church over there, this international church. And um, we're, we're, we're standing there worshiping. And I just realize that I, I feel grateful. Like I just feel so full in life that I have everything that I need. Um, and I, I kind of, I, I, I got so emotional that day at, at, at that service, um, realizing, okay, I don't need this. Um, and, and just feeling like maybe that was the journey that I, I, I've been on all this time for, for God to show me that, you know, there, there are more important things to life and um, this thing, I, I can be free of it finally. Um, and then Monday, I, uh, the, the, the wrinkle of the whole thing was on Monday, I found out that A24 decided, okay, we're gonna go ahead and do this. Mm. Um, so we celebrated really hard, my wife and I, we were, we were so excited. But from April and May and June, we just had to assemble the entire team, get everything ready, cast all the characters, the kids and everything and, and, and be able to shoot this in July. Um, and so that time frame was just crazy. Yeah, it, if, uh, for those people who are aware of productions, I mean, most of the people are booked already um, like a, a year in advance, particularly like actors in Korea. Uh, but we were just so fortunate with everybody who was able to work on the film. People like Harry, I don't know how he didn't have a job already <laughs> during that, uh, that window of time. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that was an amazing process. It, my, my work as a professor was suffering because I was so busy uh, getting things together. <laughs> Harry and I, we were Skyping um, while I was in Korea. And um, that, that relationship, I, I've got to just jump back to this whole thing. I felt like that rapport, that rapport between us kind of started early on before production where we, Harry was very clear about um, his thoughts on the story and film. And um, I instantly just knew he, he knows what this film is supposed to be and I can trust him. Um, and to the point that like five days before we were even filming in Tulsa, he, he mentioned he doesn't know if the ending is gonna work. And, That's right. and I just thought, uh, Harry, you know, <laughs> I was so upset with him, uh, but and I was upset because I knew he was right, and I knew that what he was saying was completely right. So I, I like rewrote an ending uh, on the spot, and we had to like figure out how to let production deal with that. Uh, but that was the whole production. Everything was just instant. We had to work on instinct. We had to work quickly. Um, so by the time I showed up in in Harry's editing office. Uh, editing room, like I, I was completely spent. I, and I, I think the first thing I did in that editing room was I spilled my coffee all over the couch <laughs> and I was embarrassed. And I, I have to say when, when you came back, uh, I think it was mid August, 2019, when you came back from Tulsa, I remember you looked 
tired. You you look <laughs> I was tired, man. I, I, I hope I'm not I was like so tired. I hope I'm not being inappropriate, but I remember telling He Jong, my wife, I, Isaac's friend as well. I remember telling He Jong, like Isaac looked like Isaac looked like he visibly aged. He you look like just like really exhausted and drained. And yeah, it was it was one of the toughest. I hate to say this because making movies obviously is comparatively not as hard as so many other things in life, but man, that was physically one of the hardest things I've been through. It just felt like going through a marathon for a couple of months and yeah, lost I, so much weight in water as well. I want people to understand so like how, how crazy Isaac's story is for a film of this budget level. Like usually yes. at Sundance Q and A's, like, you talk about like, oh, I started writing this film 10 years ago and blah, blah, blah. Like that's not an unusual story. But the fact that from the point in which they were trying to shop the script around, which was like in, at, the, at the end of 2019. 2018, yep. But by the end of 2019, the end of the following year, we had finished the movie and had gotten into Sundance. Like that yeah, was, that's, that's, like, that's, that's crazy. an insane yeah. schedule and like, the thing that I was most worried about for Isaac was like, you know, you know, one of the precepts of like, you know, one of the principles of like writing scripts is you don't write children, you don't write exactly. animals, you know, into the story <laughs> because they're so hard to find. And like, I was so afraid for Isaac. I was like, oh my God, this is such a beautiful script. How are you going to find not just one kid, but two kids who speak, who are bilingual, you know, in, in a population of kids where there's not a lot of actors and then you find like David and Noel and like they're magical. And they're yeah, magical. Uh, yeah. And there's just point after point where like miraculous things can happen. So it's- it, it really felt that way because to, going off of what you're saying, uh, you know, you often hear stories about, you know, such and such director, you know, to find the perfect child actor, they spend years, they, they looked at 10,000 kids <laughs> and 20,000 kids. That's the common story. I, I had the exact same reaction when Isaac was telling me that, you know, there's, there was a chance that he could shoot the movie. That was also one of my first thoughts. I'm like, there's just no way you're going to find those kids in like a two months or three months. That, yeah, that just seems yeah. so unlikely. And I, I think again, uh, just to, let people know how really by I think any objective criteria how unlikely this situation was because like you were saying I think the end of 2018 I remember you know Isaac was telling me that uh, he Christina was helping that the script was going out there and and then in January so the films you guys shot the film in July and August so January this is about six months before that I remember Isaac was emailing me and Isaac was saying, yeah, you know, still waiting to hear back. And, but Christina says, maybe there's a chance that we can shoot it this summer. Uh, and then <laughs> yeah, I, I question remember, mark. Yeah. I remember you're like, that sounds wonderful, but crazy. Like how, how is that yeah. ever going to happen? Because this point, I have to say this point in time in January, this is six months away from production. We didn't know there was going to be a production. Isaac was in Korea. He was teaching. He had no plan of coming back. I remember Isaac, you were telling me, you were in your email, you were saying, oh, you know, maybe we'll stay here longer, one more year to teach. And, you know, maybe this is how life is going to go for the mm -hmm. next few years is just stay in Korea and continue teaching. And then this happened. And then from, like you were saying, April to roughly the summer, you just had a, a few months time to, to pull this together. And the film itself, yeah. given the scope, it was shot in like 25 days, which is I, I, for people who don't yeah, every day on Yeah, every day on set was kind of like that too, because Alan is, Alan is seven years old and he can only be on set like six hours a day because of commuting time from set to, to home as well, would put him over the limit of, of like a child, uh, the child work uh, labor laws. So anytime he's on set, he's in almost every scene. Uh, we're just racing and doing everything that we can to get to meet the day, to get all the shots that we need. And uh, there were many times that Lockie and I, we would just look at each other and say, and Did it work? Your, I had no your idea. DP, right? Oh yeah, yeah, the DP. We, mm -hmm. we would just acknowledge that, look, we're, we have to make this film on instinct. We have to use our intuition here. There's no time to think. And that was a thing that we would constantly say to each other, no time to think. And, uh, and it, it was a miracle that we got a lot of the shots that we did. There's a shot of like um, Stephen picking up the eggplant uh, and he finds that it's rotting and he throws it away and then he, he walks out of frame. That was 
we got that in 30 seconds and that was the last scene of the day um, and there was no light. And as soon as we got it, we had to wrap because otherwise we're going to overtime. We don't have the budget for overtime. Um, and everything just worked. The, John Roman, our focus puller, just pulled focus perfectly. Um, and yeah, every day was just like that. I remember with that scene, as soon as we got it, Lockie just buried his head in his hands for like <laughs> a minute. And then he just looked at me and said, another day on me, Nutty. <laughs> <laughs> Because that, that was just the way that it went every day. Um, the scene with the barn where we had to, you know, it, it, that whole set piece, we only had one take to, to burn that thing down. And, and the fact that it went up in flames the way that it did, the way that we timed it. Um, I mean, Harry knows the way that Steven and Yeti ran out of that barn and perfectly sat down at the right time. Um, Crazy. I, I don't know how they, I don't know how that happens still. That's just... <laughs> It's still and a miracle. You actually had to convince, like, you actually had to convince, there was a negotiation about, like, can we afford to do that? Can we afford to actually yeah. burn it down? And, and, you know, would CG fire work and stuff like that? And the fact, like, right. there was, we were always on the knife's edge of, like, something, like, not being there, not quite mm -hmm. being perfect. Like, you know, that rack focus that you're talking about or missing, a, you know, the one exterior of the, of the, of the house that we needed, you know, but like oh, every, right. every little thing was provided just enough of what we needed in order to, to yeah. get something we wanted. So it was pretty incredible bearing witness to that. Cause like when you're away from set, all you see are the results. You don't see the pain. You don't feel the heat of the day. You don't like feel the rain and you know, everything that they had to go through. You just sort of see the miraculous results. And I was just like, how is this tiny crew like we're so many people, like especially in the secondary people, they had to hire a lot of locals that didn't have a ton of experience. Like, how is it that they're that they're, you know, getting footage that looks like it's a, on a budget of like ten times what we had? And how is it that they're making their day? How is it like, you know, I, I always have an angle that I can cut to that's not going to force us into something. Um, it was pretty incredible to see. It just felt like it just felt magical that that Isaac and, and, and Lockie and like the rest of the crew were able to pull this off every day. It was, uh, yeah, it was pretty breathtaking. Just, just this past week, Lockie texted me. He said, look what I found, the last day of our call sheet. And it was uh, seven and a half pages uh, <laughs> worth of filming for our last day. That's, <laughs> again, to put that in perspective, that's an insane amount of yeah. stuff to shoot yeah, in one day. Really, that's about crazy. twice as much as you should do with a full crew. Yeah. Right? With yeah. a full crew, exactly. Yeah. And that was the day with our chickens. Yeah. So that was with our animal actors. <laughs> it, it's crazy because I think, again, just to put this in perspective, I think I know Parasite, which is a movie that takes place primarily indoor. They had perfect control of that environment. That movie took 77 days to shoot. Minari, wow. which is a movie that, <laughs> I mean, you guys saw the, the people who were watching this, they saw the movie. 25 days to shoot a movie like this is it, just crazy. And I remember our friend Ina Lee, who was there on set, she was telling me that it just felt like there was zero margin for error every day. But somehow, like you guys uh, made it happen and, and, and even went beyond uh, exceeded expectation. And I think that's just as an observer at the time, I thought it was just remarkable and, and, and felt divine in a lot of ways. Yeah, all the, all the people who worked on the film are just superheroes to me, just what, what they pulled off. And... Yeah. Um, it, it was somehow everybody bought in to, to really working hard. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think because the, the vision of the film, I feel like th there's something that people just intuitively respond to in terms of the vision of it. And, and in fact, this is something I want to ask Harry, which I didn't get to, get to ask earlier. But, but Harry, what, what was your response when you first read the script? Like, can you talk about the circumstance uh, under which you first got hold of the project? And when you read it, what, what were the thoughts that went through your head and what were you thinking? Well, Christina O, oh, who's our producer, our fearless leader producer, um, I had met her um, when I interviewed for Last Black Man in San Francisco the year before. And, um, you know, I came on as an additional editor um, on that project and we, and we stayed in touch and we were really bonded, over, uh, even from the point of the interview about our respective Korean American upbringings. And so when I was working on Euphoria, I was finishing up that show she called and said, you know, I get a lot of Asian American projects that come my way, but this one's like really special and I want you to read it. And because it's Korean American, 
because it reminded us so much, reminded me so much of some of the things that we've talked about, like you have to do this project. And that's, that's a kind of dream call that you get as, you know, any sort of department head is, you know, something that could be personally meaningful and that, you know, the key creatives think that you're perfect for. And so when I read the script, I was like, oh my gosh, like this is the movie that I've been dying to work on ever since I decided to be, you know, to go into film full time. Because I think my motivations for wanting to go into film, even from college was, I was really influenced by the Asian American literature movement, Asian American um, history, you know, that I was studying for the first time. And I was so moved by the idea of like, hearing our stories and seeing our stories, you know, told. And, but I think after, as you work through the industry for a while, you start to question the commercial viability of it. You know, are the people in power ever going to, you know, green light something like this? And, or will it always sort of stay in the smaller intimate level that some like Asian American film festivals foster? I mean, really incredible sort of pools for talent, but they don't necessarily get like nationwide distribution. And mm -hmm. hearing that Plan B, you know, which did 12 Years a Slave and A24, which did Moonlight was, were behind this project, I was like, this is like a dream come true. And the story so resonated with me because like, you know, we were immigrants in the eighties too. Um, and, you know, everything from the fighting to the struggle to staying together, it was just like the movie that I've been dreaming of, of working on. And, and so like, I, if I needed to reach through the Skype and like grab hold of Isaac and force him to make me the editor, I would have found a way to do it. <laughs> Did you do that? <laughs> I needed to work on this. Like, you know, I, I would have called my Korean relatives in Seoul and been like, go and talk to this guy. Like, you know, like, you know, but, but thankfully, none of those heavy hands. You played it pretty cool though. <laughs> play play the hard to get it's kind of it's, it's good <laughs> it's all right it's good. <laughs> that's crazy and i think about that the the the, the immigrant angle the korean american angle i think that's something we do want to spend some time talking about because I, I think number one maybe this is the way i'll, I'll start because even i think just the fact that it is mostly in the Korean language. I, I think that itself is actually quite remarkable because I do remember again, Isaac, that initially before the film got made, you know, you were thinking maybe depending on what happens, maybe it's a movie that you might have to shoot in English and people speak with an mm -hmm. accent, which is something that, you know, Hollywood has done many times before. So that, that whole process of deciding to shoot it in Korean and really make this a very authentically uh, Asian American or Korean American film about this immigrant family. I was wondering if you can just reflect on, on that a little bit more in terms of this being a very, the, the movie being about a very particular uh, cultural context. Yeah, I, I did write it with, I, I, I didn't have any real models for this of knowing what's possible and what I'd be able to get away with. So I, I wrote a version of it where it was mostly in English and they speak in broken English with each other. Um, and that was kind of the script that was was being shown around. Um, and it was later in the process when um, I was working with Plan B that Christina O oh started to ask me like, what do you really want to do? Like, what would you actually want to do with the language? And um, she, she encouraged me, look, if you feel like they should be speaking Korean, then we can fight for that. And I, I just found that to be so refreshing to hear her say that. And then for her, that she completely understands why it should be in Korean. And, and obviously that, that was always in my mind that that's the ideal way to do it, to, to film it the way that I remember uh, growing up where we, we speak in Korean mostly in the, in the household. Um, I think lucky for us, the, the script itself, it, it helps most people forget that the whole film is in Korean because it's all written in English. Um, and it, it's honestly, it, it's a challenge for lots of people to work on a film that is completely in Korea, not just the, the financiers necessarily, don't necessarily have the models for what works and what doesn't. Um, lucky for us, The Farewell came out um, the summer mm -hmm. we were filming and it, it started to do quite well. So that kind of provided some comfort for lots of folks that, um, hey, we could make a film that's in Korean and it's gonna be okay. Like people are willing to read subtitles. And then Parasite 
of course, started to do really well. Um, but by, by that point, um, we were already in the can, so that, that wasn't influencing us as much. But um, yeah, uh, I, I guess just to, to answer your question, um, it, it did feel like a risk in some ways where we didn't know at the time we were making the decision. Um, but at this point, it's good that we're, what we're seeing is that our instinct fits with what the audiences are saying, which is they're totally fine with subtitles and they're supportive and they're actually um, coming out in force and, and, and saying that reading subtitles is great. You know, there, there are great films out there in, in, with subtitles. Um, so it, it's an interesting time in the industry as a whole, I think. And, and I'm so glad to uh, to have been able to do this at this moment. Yeah, and I think the film, in my opinion, I feel like it, it, it would really help, I think, it will, it will help to normalize that because I think a lot of people in, in the US, they are not used to reading subtitles, even though I think for people who do watch international cinema, that is a, a norm, that is just something you do. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I think now, you know, to, to have American stories told in a different language, in this case, in Korean, in the case of the farewell in, in Mandarin Chinese, I, I think that itself is a remarkable fact. It, it's, it, it should be normative, but given the way the country has been, it's also a remarkable thing. And, and I find that uh, really compelling as well. Yeah. Um, and I think now that I think I do want to talk a little bit about, I think the, the, the story itself, uh, especially in terms of your creative vision. And uh, I think also some of the spiritual substance that went into it. So could you talk a little bit about for me, you know, among other things, it is a movie about an Asian American family living in the South. But, but yeah, the movie, I think the, the reason why it's done well with audience and critics and, and really resonates with people is that it's also a very universal and almost primal and uh, elemental story about human migration, about resilience, about perseverance. Uh, so I feel like there, there, there are these interesting kind of you can say biblical scriptural motifs or motifs from literature, the, the American frontier films and so on. So can you talk about some of the creative things or maybe the spiritual things that maybe informed uh, your making and writing of this movie? Um, I, yeah, I, I did have a lot of those uh, older Western frontier sort of stories in mind as I was working on this. Um, primarily uh, because with my parents coming to the US, a lot of that was due to the fact that my dad had been watching Hollywood films as a young man. Um, and those films inspired him to come to America. Like he, he, he saw his uh, fantasies within films like um, uh, Big Country and uh, Giant and East of Eden. Like he would watch these films and really dream of, of coming to the US. Um, so, so that, that played into my mind quite a lot as I was doing this film and, and wanting it to be in that mold of an old classic uh, Hollywood film about, um, about people trying to make it on the land. Um, I, I know that this story is particular to my own story at the same time and the story of immigrants. Um, so it's not necessarily the same as um, other reasons why people have come to the U.S. You know, there are reasons they were forced here or they were, um, they were here because uh, they're refugees. Um, so I, I, I don't want to say that this story is somehow universal to the American story, you know, especially with Native Americans as well. Um, but it, it certainly speaks to uh, the idea of wanting to come to a place and to recreate yourself and to make yourself new. Um, and I think that's what this family is essentially doing um, in different ways. Jacob feels like it's all about work and it's about the land and it's about uh, realizing his dreams. And I think that speaks to a lot of our own culture. And um, obviously the other family members have other concerns. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know if that answers the, the question at all, but um, th those were kind of the things that were circulating for me when it comes to the idea of migration. You know, because I, oh, go ahead, Terry. I'll just to interject is I remember um, the, the, there were some explicit allusions in the script that some of which we, we uh, Isaac actually shot that pointed to this, the farm and, um, as being a, almost a kind of mythical place. Like, I mean, 
um, Jacob talks about it as being, you know, an Eden that he wants to create. And um, actually, I remember that there, we actually, there was in this idea of as brokenness starts to enter into the family's life, there was an explicit snake that, that, that was actually scripted and that we shot. Uh, and what was really interesting about seeing, uh, working through that process was like um, the explicit cinematic representation of the snake and the snake's POV and then it actually appearing at some point in the, um, in, the, in the double wide, in the trailer at some point became almost unnecessary because um, it felt redundant with, because people were already getting that sense that this was, this, this, the farm and what it represented was, uh, was already being represented as a kind of mythical thing, that there was, that there was, um, that it wasn't just the place in and of itself, that there, there were ideas at work and, and conflicts at work um, that felt uh, very literary and not just specific to the family um, that we're already working so that we could remove some of that, those things because that kind of, um, that kind, those kinds of archetypes were already working for people in the audience. And so I felt like there, there are magical things that happen because of the cinematography, because of the, especially because of Emile's music, for example. Oh like yeah. Elevated the story in a way beyond just uh, reportage or biography, it elevated into this sense of like fable or myth. And, uh, and allowed us to sort of enter into that space without necessarily an explicit representation of that. Because mm -hmm. I feel like even, uh, you know, like the references to Eden and also the characters' names, like Jacob and David, I, I think there are just a lot of things in this movie, I think that call to mind. Uh, like, well, Harry, what you were saying, I think the idea, the, you know, mythical ideals, uh, ancient ideals, and, and somehow this is the human story, you know, resilience and um, perseverance and, uh, moving from place to place and uh, being a foreign country and being an alien land. I think that itself, I think certainly for people who are Christians and people of faith who watch this, I think it, it's hard not to make that kind of association thinking about, I think, especially the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, in terms of the journeys that those characters went through, whether it's Abraham yeah. or Jacob and, and, and so on. Can you, uh, Isaac, talk about the title, Minari? Was that something that you decided on very early on, or is that something that you discover uh, along the way? You know, how did that title come about? Um, that that was uh, near the beginning as I was writing down the memories, um, just because it is something that my grandmother, she, she brought these uh, Korean vegetables, uh, minari to America, and I'd never heard of what, what this stuff was. And, um, but she would plant it, she was very proud of her plantings and, um, she would always want to take me there to the Minati patch where we would uh, go and she would gather stuff and I would, I would throw rocks at snakes. Uh, <laughs> truly, I, I would. And uh, I would sing songs to her. So I, I, I had that memory and I kind of wanted that to be in a film. And uh, when I started to research the actual plant, I mean, I was, I, I, I was surprised to find that there's something very poetic about it. It, um, it dies away on the first year, like you don't really harvest it. And it's, it's always the second year that you harvest. And then um, it just has a lot of uh, purifying qualities in it. Like it, it tends to clean out water. If, it, if you plant it in a very dirty brackish sort of water, apparently it helps the water to become clean. Uh, and there's so much imagery in this film and, and uh, themes about water. Like there's Jacob in the way that he gets water versus Sunja, she goes to the water. You know, there's there there there's lots of differences um, within Jacob and Sunja. So I thought that was an interesting element between the plant of Minari and, and water itself. So um, seemed like it was the perfect plant to to be a catch-all for the things I was thinking about with this film. Um, yeah, and that that Minari itself, my dad planted it. He he started to, he, he knew that I was going to make this film. Um, and uh, he started to grow some Minari. And, um, and, and uh, we, we sent some art people over to pick up the Minari and, and bring it and, and plant it over in the creek. And um, yeah, so that's, that's my dad's Minari. And 
uh, that's that's an element that I am just so fond of. My dad went back, and the reason I'm smiling, my dad went back like a couple months ago, because being a Korean dad, he's like, it's just wasting over there. You guys never picked. Oh, he went back to the locate to the location. Yeah, he's like, oh, give wow. me the Google map. Got the Minari, right? it is. I'm gonna go get the Minari. And just, so I gave him the Google map. I'm like, Dad, there's there's coronavirus is going on. I don't know if you should do this. Um, and he went back there, but then he took a picture. There were all these floods, so all of it got oh, that, that creek man. got flooded, and and so that place is no more. That that place is in the cin. Uh, yeah, we have remembered it in the cinematic space. Oh but. no! So the, uh, for for the future Minari tour, like for fans of the movie who want to go on location, that yeah, that's I'm not sorry, an option. That, yeah, it's just a big mudslide at this point. So. Wow, gonna have to build an artificial thing. Guys. Park. <laughs> wow, that's that's yeah. that's crazy. And uh, I, I know we do have a time limit uh, on this, so I, I don't want to go on for too long, but I, I would like to touch on a, a couple more things if you guys are, are oh, okay, sure. yeah, uh, yeah. With, with the time. Because I, I, I think, I think just, so I just keep thinking about your dad driving uh, <laughs> to, to the Minari patch, that image <laughs> somehow is really sticking. But um, I mean, in, in terms of the portrayal, because we haven't talked about this very much, but the, I think the characters, the family dynamic, this, the story itself, um, how much of this would you say are actually based on you know, your parents or your grandma? How much of it was dramatized? And I know, you know, watching this, there are sort of two stories going on. You have the A story, which is about the parents, the, the, the family struggle. But I think the really, uh, the, the core relationship, I think for a lot of people who watch this movie is the relationship between uh, the grandma and, uh, and, and the grandson. So how much of that is drawn from your own experience in terms of that, I think especially David's character, who at first was actually kind of resistant to the grandma, but really yeah, yeah. embraced her and loved her. It was that, is that something that was true of your own relationship? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say almost every scene in the film, there's some real basis for it. Some, something that really draws from something that happened in real life. Um, I won't go into details with every scene because <laughs> there's some weird scenes in that film. Scene number one, um, is this real? Or... <laughs> yeah. One by one, script page by page. This one, not real. This one, yeah. Not, yeah fake, I... real, fake. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the the characters definitely have been changed. Uh, and uh, and that also comes came out in the creative process. I, I wanted to make sure that everybody has their shot of making these characters their own, every actor. So um, I didn't want anyone to imitate family members. Um, as I was writing, I drew out um, different elements and themes in certain characters. So, you know, my dad is not like Jacob in, in many ways. And my mom is, is not like um, Monica in many ways. So th th there are things that I did just to try to bring out the the conflict between the two and um for, for instance like the spiritual stuff like my dad was um a very devout believer and um in the film jacob is is quite a, a skeptic and kind of makes fun of it and pokes fun at it so you know there are things that i did that i worried like is my dad going to take this the wrong way when he sees the film uh, will he be offended um and so i i can only say that it is not him uh, because I have promised my dad I would say that in every interview that <laughs> Jacob is not my dad. <laughs> you, you would say that on top of every interview, even like when no one is asking. Oh, by the way, I just want to say Jacob's not <laughs> my dad. Way, Jacob, it's not my dad. <laughs> but 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 do do talk about that actually in terms of your parents' reaction to the movie. Because because again, I I, I know that you know from many years you've thought about possibly making a movie like this, telling your family mm. story. But I remember the one thing you were always, always worried about was how your parents were going to react to it. Um, and I remember at one point, you know, you would like just trying to like not say anything. You were, I remember you telling me that my dad's going to kill me when he finds out that I'm writing stories like this. Can you talk about that? I wasn't like, exaggerating. I, I thought he was going to kill me. I, I was, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, haha, Isaac, that's funny. You're like, no, really, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, where are you going to? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I was very stressed out. My... Um, you know, my parents had a, a pretty hard life in many ways. And um, 
they're like anyone else. They don't want anyone feeling sorry for them. They don't want to be looked down upon in any way as well. So I, I worried about those things um, to show the struggle. Um, I, I felt my parents are proud people, so they don't want to show that side of themselves and be vulnerable. Um, and and that's, a, that's fine, that's totally valid. Um, so I worried about that. And then also I just worry, I just knew anytime someone talks about uh, me and, and as a secondary character in their story or whatever, you know, you always think it's, it's like one of those times when someone says, I know somebody who looks just like you. And then they show you their picture and you get <laughs> slightly offended. I mean, that's, that, that's something I, I was worried would happen here with this film. You know, you, you, you kind of show them what you think is a semblance of them and they would, they would be offended by that. Um, but what, what ended up happening was that they watched the film with me on Thanksgiving of 2019 after we had found out, um, I think we found out we were going to Sundance at that point. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure of the timing. Yeah, uh, but we, we, we had gotten in and I, and I was like so surprised because I was like, we were talking about Sundance, but the screening you were most worried about was showing the film to your family during Thanksgiving. Yeah. And I was like, why are you worried about that? Like, why not worried about like the Sundance screening? But yeah. <laughs> I was so touched because you guys prepared for me a copy to show my parents without the watermark and you, like you knew how much this meant to me. And, and wow. um, yeah, that was really touching for me, what, what you guys did. But yeah, I, I showed it to them and they, um, I mean, it was, it was an incredible moment for all of us. And it stopped being about that, like the, have I done a good job and offended you or whatever. And the, the feeling of the room shifted to a remembrance of like what we went through as a family and what we survived together as a family. Um, and, and we all just got up and started embracing at the end. Um, and it, it was like, we were just saying, we, we did it, we made it through this life. And we, um, you know, they, they were kind of looking at, they were kind of saying, you know, you, you see us. And that, that was the feeling like we, we know each other, we see each other, mm -hmm. uh, we understand each other. Um, so there's something um, so, so amazing about that moment that I, I it, it's just hard to articulate. Um, so, yeah. It, I, I remember, um... Because I think it is remarkable to me, I think on, on the many different levels that this film works, I think both in terms of you know, how it's appeal publicly to the to viewers and critics, but I think also even just in a very private and personal capacity that this film, among other things, it became almost a tool of reconciliation or, or understanding between your own family members. And, and that part I find just remarkable, especially, I mean, really knowing how stressed you were about showing it to your parents and, and, and not, just on, not just for a short period of time, but I remember for many years, you were talking about this and you were saying, I like my parents are, you were so worried about it yeah. for years. And then when, when you told me what happened at that screening, it really felt like it was this amazing climax or happy ending you know, after years of hearing how stressed and worried you were. And then to hear that it, it had such an amazing, uh, impact on your family like I when I told Hijam my wife she just she started crying like right away and it's I don't know why I'm going with this but I, I just it's, it's it's amazing I think, no, but I think yeah echoes, I, I'm grateful for I think it. I think it echoes a lot of what I've been hearing from friends and family too of how the way the story is told and the way the film focuses on relationships versus plot. I mean, certainly there is an important arc of the story, but like so much of it are these moments that remind you of, oh, this is what it felt like to be with my grandmother, or this is what it felt like to, to listen to my parents fight, or this is what it felt like to, to find reconciliation. And, you know, and, that, and I've found that like in, in listening to my friends, it transcends culture too, like it, because it felt so specific that like, you know, I have a Latino friend that was like, I used to watch wrestling with my grandmother on Sundays too. <laughs> like that, brought back, like, yeah. that brought back so many memories for him. And I feel like that's the gift of the film is that it, 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 so it, it sparks those memories of like, oh, this is what it felt like to be in that relationship and to be in this family relationship. And it kind of honors that. 
I, um, I, I had a lot of conversations at Sundance where people would tell me that they were going to call their parents after <laughs> watching the film or call their grandparents. And um, to what you're saying, I mean, that's really the greatest thing that I could hope for with this. I, I feel like that makes it so rewarding just to hear these stories. And um, if, if, it, if it brings families together in some way, like, like it did for mine, I mean, wow, that, that would be incredible. Because I feel like, you know, I think in, in every family, I feel like, you know, there is bound to be a distance between parents and children. I think that's, that's a fact. But I think maybe especially in, in, the, in, in, in the, the Asian immigrant context, I think from, certainly from my own experience, I think the, between especially I think father and, uh, and, and, and children and child, I, I think there is, you know, Asian parents, some, they are kind of stoic. Sometimes, you know, you don't know how to talk to them and, and break things down. So I, I think- You just have to make a movie, Eugene. Is <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's the advice here. If you want to have any- That's the lesson. <laughs> that's the lesson. Make a feature film. <laughs> and all the family problems will be, will be fixed. No, yeah. No, but, but to echo what Harry was saying, I, I think that is the reaction I'm seeing, even on social media. I think people mm. are saying this, has done this for my family. This made me want to talk to my grandma, to my parents, and this has brought, in small ways, reconciliation and understanding uh, to 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 my family. That's what I've been yeah. seeing consistently on the on the social media. So I think if the movie accomplishes nothing else, and certainly I think it will accomplish a lot, but I, I think that itself is an amazing thing that mm. feels, um, again, it feels just so restorative and healing uh, on so many levels. Yeah, that that'd be. That'd be amazing. Yeah, I, amen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this feels like a good time to kind of draw this to a close, but I, I think to uh, really end this conversation, because now, you know, we're recording this conversation. It's going to be watched uh, on January 13th, and uh, the movie is coming out uh, February 12th. And, uh, you know, it already is, is out there, you know, festival, people have seen it, critics are watching it. Um, and uh, it's certainly, you know, being talked about a lot and, and it's now a key contender in the award season. So I, I think just in the, now that you guys are in the thick of this, you know, after having gone through everything you just talked about, the, the journey that's associated with this movie, the journey and the perseverance, the hard work that went into the making of this movie. How are you feeling now? I think in general, in terms of now the movie is about to really, after a year, uh, you know, last year was just it's such a crazy year, and now it's finally going to mm. see the light of day. Um, any thoughts or reflections uh, on that? Oh, you want to start? <laughs> sure, I'll start. I start with a little anecdote. Um, uh, I, towards the end of Sundance, you know, after my wife had left and Isaac's wife had left and and his and Livia had left. Um, I crashed at Isaac's hotel room and we were like, we were like two kids at a summer camp together. And we were just reflecting on like, people are telling us that the reaction to this film is pretty unprecedented, which is surreal. Cause like, and, and like they're, they're making such a big deal out of it. And they're talking about the awards and stuff like that. But like, it's not like the film is any different. It's not like we're any different. Like it's just circumstantially just, it just feels so surreal. And it was nice to kind of, to share that with, with, with Isaac to, to feel like that nothing essentially about us had changed. Um, mm. Even though there's this kind of miraculous um, uh, reception that the film is getting. And so I, it was very grounding to, to have that moment with Isaac to be like, we're still the same guys who were kind of struggling in this tiny room in an old exterminator building, you know, putting the finishing touches on the film. Like, <laughs> none of that had changed, but these outward circumstances <laughs> certainly have changed. But it was really grounding to share that moment of, I guess, um, uh, simplicity with Isaac. Um, and I, I feel like I keep going back to that moment, you know, as awards conversations are happening, is I feel like, uh, maybe we can't take credit for it. And that's kind of liberating. And I feel like uh, with so many good things that have been happening as a result of the film, having uh, an identity where you don't have to take credit for the blessings that you get 
which I think leads to so much more pressure to try to reproduce that or to live up to that has been really um, such a gift, right? And, and so I, I feel no matter what happens, like that, that, that kind of hopefully will keep us centered. Isaac, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess I think about it in those terms a lot too. Just felt like the whole process, there was, a, there was hard work involved, but there was also a lot of surrender and acceptance for whatever happens. Um, and that's been the theme of 2020 as well. Um, so I, I don't know what's gonna happen and uh, I don't feel too anxious about it though. I feel like um, what, what will need to happen with the film and the rollout, it's, it's just what it will need to be. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a good journey. Yeah, I, I feel like, again, just as a, as a friend and observer, I, I just feel like for me, certainly as a, as a person, as a filmmaker, <laughs> artist, um, I feel like the it's 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 the movie has been exemplary in so many ways because I do know that the way that Isaac that you went about writing it and making it it really was a process of surrendering and it almost felt like a devotional process because obviously you know you're a person of faith and uh, you know the the way you made your past films including the work that we did together you know there was always an element of devotion and surrendering as well but i think on this there was just something very remarkable about it how i think from the conception of the movie throughout the writing of it and then to the prepping the making it it, it really felt like you you again i don't want to over spiritualize it but it felt like there was this very conscious decision to surrender to have to be in that posture this posture of just seeing this whole process as a as an act of faith and uh and uh almost a form of spiritual discipline as it were do you feel that mm. at all um <laughs> what if, like, yes uh, no <laughs> yeah. i i do feel that with the, with the caveat of knowing that um i could still do those things and the outcome could still be different and um it it it's not tied to the success of it if that makes yeah, it, it, does that make sense? Like it, it Absolutely. like, um, yeah, the di discipline I've, I've kind of decided in life, I've got to have that and no matter the outcome. So it, at least it makes the work itself more fulfilling and, uh, makes the work feel more honest, uh, in some way. So, yeah, I think I know exactly what you mean. Cause I feel, especially from the faith perspective, I think sometimes people like to, I think maybe romanticize that too much feeling like, you know, if you just surrender, you just pray, you do your part, everything's going to work out fine. But as we all know, sometimes that's, that's not the case actually. In fact, yeah, a lot yeah. of times that's not the case, but what matters at the end of the day, I think is that, is that posture, as you said, just no matter what happens, you just keep, right, keep, right. Uh, keep forging ahead. Um, so, yeah, I think on that note, um, you know, I, I think, you know, we've talked for a long time and I think we can continue to talk, but I think just for the sake of this particular conversation for the fall, for the audience, I think we'll try to a close. But I think, uh, I, again, I'm speaking as myself, but also I'm representing Fuller in this particular conversation. And I, I, I know how touched and moved and excited that people at Fuller are um, regarding this event and how deeply touched and inspired they are by this movie. So. I think I just want to take this opportunity to thank both of you once again, um, Isaac and Harry for participating in this conversation, for doing it. And Isaac, I didn't say this at the outset, but Isaac actually has had a uh, you know, very meaningful association with Fuller. I think uh, you, know, you and I, we taught a film workshop there uh, at, uh, at Fuller with our friend, Sam Anderson back in, I think 2016, mm -hmm. 2017. And yeah, then yeah. we've done Q and A's there on your previous films. So I know Fuller is just, you know, they're very supportive of your work and, uh, and, and they're grateful that you've come back once again uh, to share this amazing movie with us. So thank you, Isaac. Oh, yeah, that, that means a lot. I'm, I'm very fond of uh, all the people I meet from Fuller. So yeah, um, I think I'll be happy. Yeah, I just I want to say thank you to them. Thanks yeah. for the film, everybody. And I just want to shout out to uh, my brothers and sisters at Tapestry LA too, who are part of the audience too. That's right, Tapestry. <laughs> Absolutely. And again, on behalf of Fuller, on behalf of Real Spirituality and the Asian American Center, Rob Johnston, Ruth Schmidt, Elijah Davison, Carter Calloway, uh, Daniel Lee, and Jason Chu, and many others, thank you guys again for doing this conversation with us. 
Thank you. Bye. Bye.